Good evening, members. I welcome to the today's Sai Sarkar latest updates on GST. We have with us Sri Chandrasekhar B. I request Member Bank Chairman Savan Bhutto to escort the speaker on the dais. I welcome the floor. Graduate from Vijaya College. He has secured the 40th rank in the CA Foundation exam conducted by the Institute of Chandra Accounts of India. He is currently partner of Mr. Shekhar and Yatish Chandra Accounts, Bangalore, and is in his 19th year of practice. He is a member of Artha, a forum on indirect taxes, Akshara, a forum on taxation and general development, member of Federation of Karnataka, Chamber of Commerce. Other areas of interest of reading, listening, listening to music, teaching, etc. But he has presented various papers at various forums for both industry and charter accounts in the field of internal taxes, GST. He is one of the members in the GST faculty of ICI. With this brief introduction, I present before you CA Chatashekar B. Good evening, friends. So, I think uh, GST, Goods and Service Tax, is about one and a half year old. It's crossed the 500 day mark. And uh, we have seen there are a number of changes in this particular uh, law. And uh, there are a number of uh, uh, aspects which are to be looked into. When we are looking at an updation of the law, generally what are the things which come to the mind? One is we need to look at the law, the rules, when we have to follow a particular uh, law. And in this particular law, what are the other things which are to be looked into? Are the press releases, circulars, notifications, and uh, you have uh, now we have the tweets which are updated. Earlier under the service tax or the excise regime we didn't have tweets. Now you have tweets where uh, the ministry itself uh, is giving you what is the aspects which are supposed to get into the forum or into a notification or into the circular or into the meetings sir, are being indicated to the tweets itself. One indication is given then it's formed in the form of a council meeting. So here, with respect to the GST law, we have seen that the law is a consortium of both the center and the state put together. The center also has lost some amount of power. The state also has lost some amount of power. It is the GST council which is going to sit and they are going to look at the uh, decisions what have to be taken based on the based on the recommendations of different ministers and along with the finance minister and finance minister heads the team and you see that uh, the, there was a recent 31st GST council meeting which was there on, on the 22nd of this particular month. We have seen a lot of changes. We hope to see a lot of positive changes in this particular updates as well. So, with this uh, we uh, get into the subject. We see that uh, the collections 
we have seen that uh, there are, uh, on an average, if you see during the last financial year, it was about 89,000 crores was a collection of uh, the GST on an average. When you look at 17, 18, and 18, 19, you see that the average was about 97,000 crores overall. So, is it that only this uh, uh, revenue? How is this revenue coming? So, it is coming in the form of taxes where uh, you have seen that it is a CGST, SGST and in the form of three, that is the IGST and there are some amount of CSS which are also there which is there as a part of the collection stream as such. So, we have seen that there are a number of changes which I was telling. So, there are over about 650 changes or the notifications which have been released overall. So, if we have to be updated today, we have to look at uh, about 650. But you look at most of them out of the 650, you see the uh, rate notifications or uh, when you look at the see, uh, central tax notifications, lot of them have been uh, given uh, as a beneficial piece of legislation. Most of them are today given as a beneficial piece of legislation to overcome the issues which have been faced by the industry and commerce. One, it could be the filing of the returns itself, they are giving a leeway, so they are postponing the returns, they are giving us some more time for us, there is a breathing space which has been given for each of the returns which have to be done, but nevertheless we have been fighting for a number of things where it could be that the return is not getting uploaded or you see that at few junctions uh, the uh, website is completely full and you say, see that there are, it gives a message uh, about uh, 80,000 users are uh, filing at this moment and other things. But however, we see that those things have got streamlined over a period of time and uh, it's more simple except for we are looking at the main issues which are today which are bothering us are the refunds. So basically where it's uh, the exporters or where the inverted duty structure where the refunds are held because of clerical errors or mistakes which are there which we have identified and which we have seen. And off late uh, we have seen that from April 2018 to November 18 there was about 12,766 crores has been uh, or the cases of uh, where the collections could have come and where the people are not filed or it could be there could be fraudulent transactions. Uh, these all are identified and uh, these amounts have been uh, seen that these particular uh, uh, taxes have been collected to the extent of about uh, I think 8000 crores, 7900 crores have been collected by the department and you see Karnataka alone about 800 crores uh, was the uh, recoverable amount and they have recovered about 600 crores already. And you have seen that uh, a little more on the last, uh, from the last one, one and a half month also you have seen that a little more uh, targets they have got in the internally uh, when we speak to the department also the enforcement of the intelligence team they tell that uh, we have got uh, uh, targets to achieve and uh, you see that a lot of vehicles are stopped uh, and if the e-vehicles are not there then they are immediately leaving the penalty as such and uh, uh, they are not uh, uh, in this particular thing which are where we need to be careful how we need to be careful we shall look at all these aspects in this update session what we are looking at per se so these are the latest uh, we we'll just first uh, get into the latest press releases which are uh, there which have uh, taken place from the last couple of days that is from uh, December 22nd onwards after the GST council's uh, 31st meeting so we will understand each one as to whether it was beneficial or not beneficial and I will try to touch upon as many as possible uh, so that it is covering a wide uh, coverage here. So here uh, one of the things is it tells that they want to make it simplified. You want to have, they want to have only one tax, tax account like uh, you, you are not going to have a separate tax penalty and interest separately which has to be given, you will have a single cash ledger account which is going to be there and you are going to deposit that amount, that amount can be utilized for any of these things. So what is going to happen here? We are going to avoid confusions or paying interest instead of, uh, instead of the tax or uh, the penalty. So we are going to pay everything as one account. So probably we can, we may have, uh, if this simplified to about four accounts you may have probably for the IGST, CGST, SGST and the CESA separately could be there probably will have to wait for the notifications. Then they want to bring a single authority for uh, uh, issuing of the refunds. As of now what is happening, if you file for a refund application, 
It is processed at the CGST officer or the SGST officer, uh, officer first. Then it goes to the jurisdictional other part, counterpart. So here it is done by a CGST officer, then it goes to the SGST officer and they also have to approve it for these people to release. So that is what we will have to visit two offices. So now what they want is, they want to have a single place or one officer. Maybe they are going to ask the cases have already been allocated. This is the SGST officer cases, this is the CGST officer cases. So they may tell that this particular officer itself will be given the authority to issue the refund orders for this particular payment. So that is also, it appears to be a beneficial piece because we will, uh, the shuttling between departments is going to get avoided. So it is going to be at one jurisdiction. Then they, are, they, are, uh, they want to introduce the new forms which is from 1-4-2019. Already I think from January 1st week the trial of the new forms is going to take place and there is going to be a, be a transactions which is taken place. And uh, this becomes mandatory from 1-7-2019. That is what they are trying to propose. So they don't want to make uh, anything, uh, they don't want to get into too many new things probably. Uh, that is one aspect. And with respect to the audit 9A and 9C, they are proposing uh, the due date to be 30th of June. So as of now it is extended for 30th March. So but uh, eventually they are seeing that because the forms are not yet ready and with this particular GSTR 99A, they also want, they are trying to look at in this particular uh, uh, few press releases and uh, uh, notifications which have been issued in this uh, regard, they have indicated that, see as of now in GSTR 9 which is the annual return, they are capturing what was the information which was filed between uh, April to March, sorry July to March and April to September because July to March was the last financial year whatever was there, 17-18, whatever errors or rectifications which we had committed because of circular 26 bar 2017 we had a leeway and we got all those errors got rectified and that happened during April to September then we were, we had to segregate this into two informations, one is up to the first uh, block between July to March 18, then other one was April to September 18. We were supposed to have two particular informations which had to be bifurcated as such. Okay? So now they want to introduce a few more columns in the GSTR 9 itself. It appears that they want to know what is the actual transaction value which should have been declared in the which are, which should have been declared say if a transaction of 1 lakh is the accounted in the books of accounts whereas in 2017-18 I had accounted for 50,000 and between April to September I had rectified this error and I had uh, the actual transaction value is 1 lakh but I have shown 50,000 uh, 50, and another 40,000. Only 90,000 have declared in my returns. Earlier as per the annual returns only 90,000 was the amount which was getting captured. We didn't know what is the additional amount or additional tax amount which should have got was not getting captured in the annual return per se, that is what when you look at. So now in this 9, there also was an indication that there is going to be a table 20 which is going to get added where they are going to come out with a table where they are going to show what is the actual liability which is supposed to be shown in the returns, <coughs> so in the annual return. And they have also made, because there was no sequence of events which with respect to the GSTR 9 and 9A, see if you have not filed your GSTR 1 and GSTR 3B, so we could have filed the annual return but there was no bar, as of now there was no bar as such. So in this recommendation they have told that if you have to file the annual return under GSTR 9, all your GST returns under 1 and 3B are also supposed to be filed. So that was one more aspect which was supposed to be covered in this regard. They have initiated that, then they have told that in a sequence, chronology, so they have told that all your, first your GST R1 and 3B have to be filed, then only your GST R9 and 9C has to be filed per se. So this was one of the basic update which was there. Then interest, this is this one is the pinching factor which was there because the department in few of the cases were telling that the amount of tax because under the excise also, if the taxes were not being paid, were paying, they were asking for the interest uh, payment on the gross amount and not on the net amount. Say I have a gross amount liability of 10 lakhs, 
I have the credit of 8 lakhs, so they are telling us at present to pay the interest on the gross liability, which is 10 lakhs, but actually the liability was only 2 lakhs. So, this is also a welcome move, which but the uh, only thing if this change comes, it's going to be, it appears to be, it is going to be on a prospective because generally any change on this nature, whatever has come in the history now we are seeing, is on a prospective nature because if it goes on a retrospective nature, then there could be a possibility of refunds which have to be given as such. Then we have also been, uh, we have been updated by newspapers that uh, there is going to be a reduction in the GST rates and 99% of the products, uh, that was the initial recommendation, 99 products will come to the less than 28% category. But as of now, I don't see so many products which are being moved from the 28% to the lower rates, but they have identified a list of products and they have reduced the rates in this regard. So you have been seeing that uh, with respect to disabled uh, uh, people, uh, whatever carriages for the disabled, they have been identified and they have told it's 28 to 5 percent. I just name a few of these uh, lists because uh, I am not be getting into too many product lists as such. Then with respect to cinema tickets, uh, they have told uh, it's going to be, uh, if the amount of ticket is above 100 rupees, then it will be going to be reduced from 28 to 18 percent and if it is uh, less than 100 rupees, it is 18 to 12%. So there are a number of other uh, components where uh, it's also told that with respect to 28 to 12 percent you have this uh, uh, pulleys, transmission shafts, crankshaft, cranks and gearboxes, all these things they want to reduce it from 28 to 18 percent, monitors, TVs, re-threaded uh, re, uh, uh, tires, so which are there, then power banks with uh, lithium batteries, then you have digital cameras and uh, video camera recorders. Then you have the video game consoles, all these things they want to reduce from 28 to 18 percent. So if it is an end user, then there is going to be some amount of saving on these particular taxes. So if it is a marble rubble, marble rubble is nothing but the waste of marble or the marble pieces waste or scrap, whatever they call it as. So on these particular things, it is going to get reduced from 18 to 5 percent. Then if it is a cork, roughly squared, damaged uh, or articles of natural cork and agglomerated cork, this is 18% to 12%. Then you have 12% to 5% natural cork and walking, cork, walking stick, flying ashes, whatever blocks. Then you have 12% to nail the music books. So here we need to look at what sort of music books are they speaking about. It is more of a music, I think it relates to music books with uh, the uh, songs or with respect to the uh, classical music or uh, something where that is uh, there as a part of it could be involved here. Then with respect to 5% to nil is the vegetables that are uh, frozen, branded and put in unit containers. So they want to probably, this is a good boost for the agri industry. But only thing we have to see what is the, if it is there at 5% now. So what is going to happen here in these particular industries is they may lose out on the input credit. That is one aspect we have to keep in mind. That could also increase my costing. But generally what happens in case of vegetables or uh, whatever they are trying to look at in this, only the uh, whatever the uh, agent what they use or the chemicals what they are using which are going to be used as an agent to keep these vegetables or store these particular vegetables could be this uh, uh, that cost is going to add or the cost of the containers or the packing material could be a cost. So that has to be looked into. Then uh, provisionally preserved vegetables, this is another item which could be there. Then one of the important uh, one was the multimodal transport which was uh, introduced from uh, 26 7 2018. What is a multimodal transport? If I use a mode of transport where for movement of goods I use more than one shipments. It could be I use a flight. I use road transport with a flight with the inland waterways, probably. So if I want to get the goods to Bombay, so it has to come from Chennai. So I use a more one particular person is going to provide me the entire service. So he collects the goods. So I use a lorry, say probably from uh, the Chennai port to a particular place or a location. Then I use a rail from say 
Chennai to Bangalore, then from Bangalore I use a air transport. So these are called multimodal transport where I am using more than one transportation for shipment of a particular goods. There the, there was a confusion of the rate, there they have told that the rate is 12%. But this particular 12% I cannot take it for transactions which are outside India. That is what they are trying to clarify here. They are trying to tell that this particular clarification, they tell you that this one is, it has to be, the transaction has to start in India and it has to end in India. That is what it is. So it is only for domestic transport in India. That is what they are trying to envisage. Then with respect to third party insurance premium for carrying goods vehicles, they want to reduce the premium from 18 to 12%. So this is another beneficial piece of legislation. Then with respect to diploma uh, degrees, uh, with respect to IIM under uh, the IIM Act, so these were being uh, chargeable to tax. Now any diploma or any degree which is issued by the IIM is going to get exempted from GST. Then food drinks, this is another one where if educational institution is providing food for its uh, men, maybe the staff, faculty or student, if it is a part of the fees, whatever has been taken, if it is a consolidated fee, whatever is being taken, because never we get into any institution to have food, right? So we get into the institution for education, being a primary objective, so that becomes more of a composite supply and composite supply is going to drive the benefit and the food need not be taxed per se, because, but if we have a separate split, then it could be probably a situation where the department could ask but however because it is still a composite supply it need not be chargeable to tax so that is what they have done they want to give a clarification here that all educational institutions if they are collecting any amount with regard to this particular transaction it is not going to be taxed as such then banks banks are supposed to charge the GST on the entire value of services here what was happening uh, under the service tax regime, we had one option where banks, if they were, uh, there was a deduction concept which was there, similar to our VAT concept also, if there was a contract and if there was a subcontractor, only on the net value the taxes were being levied. Basically, there was a deduction under for the contractors. From the subcontractor, deduction was given. So, similarly, with respect to service tax also, if there was a business correspondent who, whom the bank has appointed, so they were taking a deduction of the subcontractor or the business correspondent deduction was being taken over. And this particular amount, now they are trying to indicate, they are telling that the liability of GST which has to be paid by the bank is on the full amount. For example, if the bank is charging 1 crore from the customer as the uh, uh, charges, and this, they have been outsourced, the entire amount has been outsourced from a business correspondent, then business correspondents were exempted from the tax because they are appointed by RBI and they were exempted from taxes, business correspondents. So this, what the bank started doing is, they were trying to probably split the amount and show it as directly payment to the business correspondent and a deduction was being claimed. Here, this particular transactions are now tax. So they are trying to indicate that it is going to be on the total gross value of whatever service uh, the banks are getting. On the total value they are supposed to pay the taxes. <laughs> then air travel uh, by pilgrims. Here what it, uh, I think it should be maybe the Manasarovar or the Hajj tri trips which are being there. Where there is a bilateral agreement between both the countries only in this particular scenario they, they have uh, told that in these cases, the arrangement shall be at the rate of 5% including of ITC which is available. That is what is the benefit which is being given. They want to pass on. Sir, don't we get uh, benefit for the state travel? Don't we get benefit for the private parties? Uh, 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 ch charter operator, being a private party, can he take this uh, benefit or uh, this should be between the two countries? No, this is a bilateral arrangement. I think uh, India has to have an arrangement with that particular country. Maybe it could be Nepal or Tibet or China. If there is a particular bilateral agreement on this particular transaction, okay. only those people, for those people, for those travels related, only for them this particular exemption is going to be there. So, so it the, is not for Indian travels? No, it does not appear to be for Indian travels. No, this is specifically for uh, religious purpose, no? They are told for religious and pilgrimages. Specifically, and there has to be a bilateral agreement bilateral arrangement for between both the countries here.
So modalities we have to wait and watch because this is all only only a press release. So we have to wait for the conditions. What sort of conditions are going to come out? So here I am just trying to put across that these are the different uh, points. So we will uh, look at the notifications when it comes into and we will have to do a little more analysis as to how, when, what, per se. Then the next one would be uh, leasing of pumps and uh, reservoirs by OMCs. So this oil uh, marketing companies, so they if they give on lease the storage tanks or uh, any of these uh, pumps which are required for the pumping of fuel, then in those cases they charge uh, license fee from the petrol pumps as such. So this license fee includes even this part of the leasing of this pumps also as part of the license fee. So now what they are trying to indicate is this sort of license fee what is paid by the petrol pumps to the OMC or oil and fire marketing companies, then in this particular transactions this is supposed to be treated as a mixed supply and they are telling the tax has to be collected at the rate of 28% and this is this appears to be more on a clarificatory in nature and maybe we might have to look at the retrospective nature also we don't know what sort of a clarification is going to be given on this or a notification in this which is going to be given in this regard. Then uh, there was a confusion with respect to leasing of uh, equipment along with the land itself. So land and building. So I want this particular office space. This particular space if I have to hire, then there is a furniture or equipment which is also given along with this particular transaction. When I, when this particular thing which is rented by me, so there is no bifurcation between the building rent and the equipment rent. The entire thing is given as one single transaction. Then in those particular transactions, they are proposing a rate of 18% in this regard. <clears throat> then uh, with respect to taxability of events, see it does not depend on uh, who is providing the service. It should depend on what is the constituents of a service and what whether it constitutes a composite supply or a mixed supply. These are the main uh, uh, aspects which have to be considered. For example, when we look at a hospital, hospital provides food. So, to patients. So, should we charge the tax or not? So, what they, uh, they this particular uh, uh, aspect they want to highlight here is with respect to hospitals or any of the entities, it could be even educational institutions also, as one of the examples which we discussed. So, this is going to determine this, uh, this taxability of the particular transaction is going to be determined by the actual uh, aspect of the transaction which is supposed to be looked into. So the constitution, uh, the constituents, uh, the breakup of each of these aspects have to be looked into. Whether in a hospital, whether the food is given separately, if it is given in the canteen, then it's a canteen service separately and that has to be charged as such. But if it is, if the food is given as a part of the treatment as such, then in that particular case, that becomes a part of the treatment and part of the treatment cannot be taxed because the hospital service is a medical service which is being uh, health service, it gets covered under health service and that becomes a composite supply. So here we will have to, when we look at the transaction, we are supposed to look into the basic constituents and not whether just because a hospital provided a particular uh, food, so if it is provided to an attender, whoever is an attender if he comes, if the food is provided to attender, then that becomes a taxable event because food is only for the patient as such and not for the attender. And room charges, whatever room charges are being given, recovered from the uh, patient. So what happens to the room charges? Room charges, if it is as a part of the, because it's a part of the treatment as such and nobody comes there to stay and there. Right? So when we look at that particular aspect, so this a person becomes, it is as a part of the treatment and that would not be taxable. But if it is an attender's amount which could be taxed. So I think recently there was a press release where I read uh, stating that they want to bifurcate these transactions also further and they want to probably tax a few of these transactions per se as well. Then they have also given uh, in one of the uh, press release uh, the supply of foods uh, which is given to educational which I told is exempted but if the food is 
provided by a contractual arrangement by somebody else comes and provides the food. For example, there is an educational institution and they approach say one of the food vendor, the food vendor comes and he supplies the food and he collects the money from the students or whoever is the person and he leaves. So that is a contractual arrangement on a daily basis he comes, he collects the food and in those cases they tell that if it is a contractual arrangement with another person for providing the food then it is going to be 5% what he is going to charge. So these are the uh, releases. Then this beneficial piece of legislation which has been uh, looked into, now uh, they have proposed, what is the proposal? They have told that there is a waiver of all returns which have been filed after 22nd of December, that is after Saturday whoever have filed their returns, for them they need not pay the late fee charges for GSTR 1 and GSTR 3B as well. So this is I think shortly by way of a notification this is going to come up I think probably on 1st of Jan I think all these notifications are expected. So whoever have filed returns up to 31st of March 2019 there it is more like an amnesty scheme they are trying to bring out so that all the returns are being filed without uh, damage but only uh, sad news is whoever have filed the returns uh, before this last uh, Saturday they have, uh, they have paid the taxes and they will not be able to get any amount of the refunds per se. And one more thing what has happened is uh, with regard to the latest update is even they are also uh, envisaging that even the input credits or ITC whatever has been left out during 17-18 they want to give some amount of leeway here and till 31st March 19 you will be given another window to claim all the input credits what have been left out in during that 1780 because September 30th was the last date for you to claim the ITC right and what was the last date for filing the returns so October 25th so October 20th that got postponed by another 5 days so before October 25th you could have claimed the credit but now I think because of the lot of industries have not claimed they have come to know at a later point of time that they have not claimed this uh, credits and other things so with I think maybe because of the industry request and uh, this particular thing is a more uh, beneficial piece of legislation where they have uh, they are giving a leeway for you to claim the credit of 17-18 given during 18-19. So we will have to wait for the notifications in this regard per se. Then with regard to uh, GTA services of the government departments or local authorities then if they have taken a registration for only for deducting tax exos. See because TDS provisions which I will discuss uh, uh, a little more in depth uh, when I come because I think a lot of people will have some doubts on TDS and TCS as well. So if you have taken a TDS registration for the purpose of remitting the, this particular only the TDS provisions per se then the government is excluded from paying RCM. Just because they took the registration only for TCS purpose or TDS purpose they need not adhere to the RCM methodologies because they don't want to burden the government and government authorities whatever are getting prescribed authorities for TDS these are the government departments or local agencies they don't want them to be burdened. So these transactions if it is in the nature of RCM will not get covered. Then security agencies like under service tax we were the security agencies were under the reverse charge mechanism. Now under GST also they want to bring this into the GST mechanism per se where they want to tell any registered person except for government departments having taken registration for TDS and entities registered under composition scheme shall be put under RCM. So reverse charge mechanism list may increase and will be notified shortly. Then this is one more important one where uh, in a few of the uh, advanced rulings which was given recently. So in this advanced ruling what has happened is with respect to solar in few of the states they gave it that solar power panel installation is a part of the renewable energy devices and they told it is at the rate of 5% in few in one of the case in uh, which was given in uh, uh, Karnataka and Maharashtra there were two divergent uh, decisions which were there. 
So that is the reason uh, I think there appears to be that the department is monitoring the advance rulings also and they are seeing that where there are uh, controversial decisions which have been given. It appears that in this particular uh, change which they have proposed, they want to bring a proposal where they want to tell that 70% of the gross value, whatever is 70% of the gross value which shall be deemed to be a supply of goods which will be attracting 5% because it's a solar power plant which is there and this is not only for solar power plant they are also trying the wordings which have been used is the value of this also could be for other valuation of EPC contracts so EPC contracts could be uh, different uh, any installation and uh, uh, engineering and installation uh, contracts which are there which uh, are a huge contracts then we might have to re relook after this particular notification is going to come we might have to see because they have identified now in the ratio of 70 is to 30 earlier even more in our VAT uh, also we had the same concept of somewhere on 70, 30, 60, 40 we had so they are trying to come out with the same concept here as well even under service tax also we had these ratios which were uh, earlier there so they are trying to bring the same concept here under GST as well so this could be another aspect so the services are going to be charged at 18% or 30% of the value that is what they want to bring they are bringing a methodology for this particular so they will be bringing some clarification in this or a notification in this regard with respect to the valuation mechanism itself probably so this was not there earlier so <clears throat> I think due dates of filing of return I already told which uh, they are intending to allow you with respect to the credits uh, with respect to GSTR 8 which is the TCS returns which have to be filed so each month it has to be filed on 7th of every month now they are trying to give a leeway here from October, November and December they have extended the date till 31st of January then the due date for filing ITC 04 what is ITC 04? Job worker Job worker so in case of job worker, so if the manufacturer assigned goods on job work, here not only the job worker, here the manufacturer also has to file this uh, form. So each form, whatever each shipment has gone, so there you will have to track the shipment <coughs> as to how much of kgs went and how much of kgs came back. In what all installments this particular thing came back, that is what has to be followed. See if the transactions are small, it's easier to follow but here I think they have also added earlier under ITC4 there were certain technical difficulties that if I sent a particular consignment of 100 shipments but I got it back in parts I was not able to file it uh, I was able to show that particular item but I was not able to show waste I was not able to show scrap how it was moving so now under the ITC04 which has come in the last uh, uh, couple of months I think in October there was a clarification which came and there was a change in the format of ITC04 where all these transactions were in included so they have made some amendment in the forms per se so for these transactions the actually the deadline was 31st of December and now they have proposed it to 31st of March per se then we will uh, get into the aspects of uh, TDS and TCS because I think uh, a lot of transactions are uh, uh, taking place where this particular uh, uh, provision which has kicked in from 1st of October, lot of doubts and lot of pro aspects are there. So we will try to see how to take it forward with this aspects. So with respect to TDS, who are the people who are supposed to so any recipient of goods or services being specified persons we will see who are the specified persons specified persons are a department or an establishment of the state government or the central government or a local authority or governmental agencies or such persons are categories of persons as will be notified by the central government or state government on the recommendation of the council so as of now we have the central government, state government and local authorities and governmental agencies these are the basic categories which have been notified and these who, who is a central government or a state government or a local body any person who has 51% or above holding by these entities or directly by the central government or by the state government or both put together if it is crossing 51% or 
there could be a management where the management is also held by the uh, governing body of this particular uh, central government or state government then these are the entities which are supposed to register so these are the people who are going to release the payments to the these are the people who are going to release payments for all public work related information so the deductee could be any registered supplier so what is the requirement specified person to mandatorily register irrespective of the threshold limit so even if you have to pay 500 rupees if the government has to pay 500 rupees to a particular person from 1st of october then probably they have to register for this tds provision per se but here on the deductive side there are for certain <coughs> values values which are to be looked into so the value of supply should exceed 250000 so if the payment or the value of this supply exceeds 250000 then we will also look at few examples to understand how or what is the amount how to arrive at in the next slide then the rate of tds is 2% if it is an igst and 1% uh, cgst plus 1% SGST which has to be on the total values then point of taxation is payment of credit whichever is earlier so return type and due date GST is 7 which has to be filed on the 10th of the succeeding month so for each of the month GST or 7 has to be filed within 10th of the succeeding month and payment also has to be made within the 10th so both payment as well as return has to be filed within 10th of the month then after this within 5 working days the TDS uh, has to be uploaded and certificates have to be issued to the deductee as such. So what is the repercussion if it is not done? Interest at the rate of 18% plus late fee of rupees 100 per day up to a maximum of 5000 rupees per act. So up to 10,000 rupees could be the penalties which could be imposed. So we have to first see in our clientele whether who for whom it is applicable, whether it is applicable, not applicable, because later on only we identify. Many a times we feel that it is not applicable at all per se, but when we get into the no, board, we need to look at what, whether they are, they are part of the central government, state government, then in that particular transactions, it will be able to identify. Then the next one with respect to TCS. So who is the person who has to collect with respect to TCS? So this TCS, any transaction which is done through an e-commerce operator. So any transaction, if it is done through an e-commerce operator. So I am a supplier, I supply goods through an e-commerce operator. So I supply a goods through say Amazon or Flipkart or Snapdeal. So I am supplying the goods or services through this particular agency. Then in that particular transaction, I will be liable. So, who will be liable? The e-commerce operator will be liable to deduct this TCS. And what is the rate? It is 0.5% of CGST and 0.5% SGST. If it is an IGST transaction, that is going to be 0.1%. Okay? Sorry, 1% of the total value. 1% will be the total amount which has to be deducted. Then here, with respect to e-commerce operators, there is a relaxation which is being given. That if the e-commerce operator if his turnover is less than 20 lakhs, then he will not deduct TDS and TCS. So, because he is not going to register itself, once he is not going to register, TDS and TCS will not be available <coughs> and that transaction need not be uh, taken forward. So, the, what is the return which has to be filed? GSTR 8 which has to be filed. And annual return which has to be filed by a TCS operator is 9B. So, it is yet to be notified. Then due date for filing uh, for payment uh, or and return or filing is 10th of the succeeding month like similar one and penalties are very similar to TDS. So what are the amendments which took place recently? So notification 61 by 18 this was one of the notification which exempts uh, uh, TDS on supply from public sector unit to another public sector unit. If it is a public sector undertaking to another public sector undertaking then there is no TDS which is supposed to be looked into. The next one is circular 74 which tells the applicability of TCS on T board. So what is the value on which the T, uh, what is the value on which the TDS has to be deducted? It has to be deducted on the net value of supply that is whatever T is auctioned minus 
TDS if any returns, the net value only the TDS is supposed to be, TCS is supposed to be none with respect to this supply of T. <coughs> then you add notification 66 bar uh, 18 which told uh, there is an extension of due date of GSTR returns, uh, GST is, uh, this is the TCR, TDS related return GSTR 7 which is being postponed up to 31st of January which is already, these are all from here onwards I will be discussing what is what executed. So till the latest amendments it was what is proposed. Okay. So there could be some changes in the proposal because not all uh, meeting uh, GST council meeting transactions were given in the form of a <coughs> notification or a circular because few were withheld. So because many uh, things which were there earlier also they told initially itself that the composition dealers is going to be at 1.5 crores. But uh, it was not done for quite some time, maybe because the amendment was expected. So, we will just try to undertake, undertake a few of the FAQs on this particular uh, topic. So, an unregistered supplier located in Karnataka provides services to uh, of rupees 2,60,000 to BWSSP, which is a governmental authority. Whether BWSSP is required to deal PDS? Yes. yes. So, because BWSSP is going to register for the purpose of this transaction and they have to deduct PDS because the value exceeded 2,60,000. X company contractors received a single purchase order of rupees 2 lakhs towards taxable supplies and 1 lakh towards exempted supplies from Bangalore municipality whether PDS is applicable. Yes. <coughs> so here uh, there is a hitch. Basically, it tells that it is a taxable supply. TDS provision tells it is a taxable supply. But when you get into the taxable supply definition, it covers this particular 1 lakh as well because this is uh, given as an exemption as such because that was already there to a levy and the total value of the transaction was 3 lakhs. So, taking that particular interpretation, uh, we have to deduct TDS on the total value. Marvel Petroleum BPCL has entered into a contract for 10 lakhs with the supplier XYZ prior to 1-10-2018. It has made a payment of 3 lakhs to XYZ prior to 1-10-2018. Now it is, it is making a payment of balance of 7 lakhs after 1-10-2018. Should it deduct tax on 10 lakhs? Ten lakhs or seven lakhs? Seven lakhs. Seven lakhs. Because it told payment of invoice whichever is earlier. Payment had already happened earlier. So the levy for that particular transaction is assumed to have taken place prior, prior period, prior to 1-10-2018. And because of that, that particular transaction is liable to TDS only on seven lakh rupees. So excess TDS deducted and paid to government erroneously by the deductor. DFT has claimed the credit into his electronic cash ledger whether refund shall be granted to the deductor. It will not be applicable because 
the location of the supplier and the place of supply has to be in in the same state and here the recipient is located in a different state then sir why so igst is 2% yeah igst 2% is there then igst because as per uh, section 51 there is a proviso which is introduced which is uh, there as a specific uh, exclusion so because of that particular provision we will not be uh, applicable this particular provision we will not be having a application and uh, there is no tax tds which is supposed to be done on this particular transaction okay then the next one uh, if the supplier a of maharashtra supplies goods to government of west bengal whether the tax is required to be deducted No, because both are no, because here also that particular proviso to that section 51 is going to be applicable, and based on that, there is not going to be a deduction because the work is happening at a different location and it is done at a different place altogether. Are there any deductions allowed, allowed while computing the tax collection or source? So, for TCS, as I was mentioning. So if the if the if the e-commerce operator through the e-commerce operation there is a sale of one lakh, but during a month there was a return of fifty thousand, then they tell the one lakh minus fifty thousand the return value should be deducted and all the TCS has to be done only on the net value that is what he tells. So then you will ask me what is the option. So next I will change the this both happened in the same month. Assume both happened in November only. Assume that sale happened in one lakh in the month of November, whereas return of fifty thousand happened in the month of December. It happened in the next month. That month I did not have any sale. So in that case, so I have to deduct TDS on November to the extent of whatever percentage is applicable. But this fifty thousand I should not consider if it is a negative value. TDS I cannot go for a refund of credit or something. So there is no option. In this scenario, because negative figures should not be considered for the purpose of TDS calculation, TCS calculations. So it's only the positive figures which are to be considered during the month. Clear? Can I just do it No, you can't do it. Only one month. No, it uh, it is during that particular month only. So if it is within that particular month, so you will have to look at these particular transactions. Very important. This is a practical scenario which could come into picture. So, but you will have to deduct. For example, one lakh is the total amount of sale in November, and the entire one lakh is returned in the next month. November the sale took place, but the return happened in the next month. If you look at the entire one lakh was done, but the e-commerce operator is supposed to pay whatever one percent or one thousand rupees he would have paid, and that is going to be deducted from your payment. <clears throat> or if you have already, if he has already paid the payment to you, he is going to recover the entire amount of. One uh, one lakh one thousand is going to recover it from you because one thousand of TDS is also being deducted as such. Okay. Then uh, whether there is any transactions made through the e-commerce operators attract uh, uh, TCS provisions even if the consideration for supply is not collected by such e-commerce operator because uh, uh, in case of TCS they tell that whoever is the e-commerce operator and what is the payment made by the e-commerce operator that is what is going to get levied and whomever the payment is going to get made so that is the person on which the TCS has to be made so that is where this particular point is clarified whether there is a requirement to file GST or 7 even if there are no tax deductions in a particular month so unlike our uh, GST returns, nil returns also will have to file. Here there is no such particular uh, requirement. So if there is nil transaction in a particular month, we need not file any TDS returns for that particular month per se. Whether can can the supplier claim TCS credit even if the e-commerce operator has not filed his GST rate for a particular period? So I have provided services say to PWSSP, PWSSP has not filed its return. Sorry, this is the e-commerce operator, say Amazon. Amazon has not filed its return. 
so it is not reflecting in my portal so then what I should do for the month of November they have not filed their return <coughs> till date but my return was already due on December 20th what should I do should I can I take a ad hoc credit and file the returns earlier under VAT we were doing it if TDA certificates were not there also, we would claim that in the VAT 100 because later on they would give me a physical hard copy of the certificate which was generated and given at a later point of time. Here? Yeah? So here whether it is TDS or TCS, unless and until the other person has uploaded and you, there is another process of you to claim the credit. It comes and sits in your account and you have to go and click it and submit it for it to come to your electronic cash ledger. Okay, this is the process. The entire process has to be done. So once this entire process is done, so because the other person has not filed his return, the deductor has not filed his return, it will not get reflected in my portal and it doesn't show in my cash ledger. So this could lead to a working capital issue so you have to make the payment and then only you have to go for the refund or you might have to if there is uh, uh, other liabilities on the future months then we will have to plan or we have to ask the deductor to file his returns and later we might have to file the our returns if we don't want any working capital issues per se. But suppose sir if uh, uh, the commission has not filed two months, three months then can you take the claim after 2 months or 3 months? Yeah, you can take the claim because it is, as I told you, it is a claim which is done and it goes directly and sits in your cash ledger so it comes and sits in your cash ledger and it can be used for your future tax liabilities. Sir, what is that with the supplier that is not available, which device I have uploaded? Because, apart from the GST number we are uploading, this month is the previous month. I don't know whether it is applicable or not. It is not aware. Because we are not able to download the certificate. Okay. Because for any issues you have, then you will have to get in touch with the help desk of the GST team. So, mm -hmm. which is sitting in uh, KG Road. We have one office where uh, uh, 20, uh, morning at 8 to evening 8 they are sitting. And uh, probably in these cases, and they are ready to help us out as well if you have certain issues. If they are technical in nature, the department is going to help. If there is a problem from your vendor or the deductor, then you will have to speak with your deductor and you will have to ask them whether they have filed their GSTR 7 or GSTR 8. If they have not filed their GSTR 7 or GSTR 8, then they are, they are supposed to file their forms, right? So if they have filed their forms, then let them send you a screenshot that they have uploaded by that particular uh, document or whatever information is supposed to be done. Then you take the document and go to the help desk and they are uh, willing to help because recently in a FKCC session also the assistant commissioner of help desk had come and uh, she told any issue is there you kindly come to us and we will see that the same is sorted out. And uh, Karnataka being uh, uh, the pioneer in this particular uh, sorting out of issues they have seen that even lot of migration issues, GST transitional issues so that even wherever you have issues, she also gave uh, assurance that if you have tried for filing your tram 1 and tram 2 and if those credits have not still come and reflected in your books of accounts, you can go and approach them and they will see that you write a letter to them and based on case to case because that I think they are going to close that by 31st of December I heard. So if, if any of you have uh, some transitional credits and some issues, then kindly get in touch with those help desk and they will see that the particular entire amount of credit is given to you. So they will take the internal permissions with the GST <coughs> help desk again, uh, GST authorities internally and it is granted to you as such. So here also any issues you have probably you will have to get in touch with the help desk wherever it is more of a technical in nature. Then now we are getting into the <coughs> even bill which is uh, the next major topic where a uh, lot of us have certain uh, issues. So here also I have tried to uh, take a few of the notifications which I felt are important or the clarifications or circulars which are important and I will be discussing them. So where there was earlier there was detections which were detentions which were happening 
and say if there was a 25 consignments in a particular shipment, but 20 shipments had the eBay bill, but only the five shipments did not have eBay bill, or five invoices did not have eBay bill. <coughs> Earlier, the entire lorry or the entire truck or the entire thing was being withheld. Now they have told that if there are out of 25, 20 are clear, then they can clear the 20. Only the five can be confiscated or it can be seized. So they can't seize the entire shipment. So this has to be kept in mind because many of the times the customers or the clients call. So they just call and they tell that our goods are seized and what has to be done now immediately. We have to make the payment. How should we make? Should we make the payment or not? This is where issues are coming up or popping up nowadays as such with respect to the documentations. Because of no, no documentation or documentation not properly maintained. Because many a times only part A of the eBay bill is uh, filled and the part B is not filled. So unless and until part B is filled, the eBay bill does not become a valid document for movement of goods. So this has to be kept in mind that the entire process has to be concluded and the goods have to be removed. If only one part is done and they assume that the, uh, many times they assume that GTA is going to do it. And in few cases they assume that uh, somebody else is going to do it for on behalf of them and if the other person does not do then there is a retention which is possible. <coughs> then with respect to this imported goods. Sir, yeah. after the retention, can a EVA bill be generated? You can generate but it is, uh, they have the authority once uh, the uh, goods are seized, uh, because it is conveyed without the uh, goods being, uh, sorry, because without the document being supported, uh, the goods have been seized. So once that is there, so they have got you right handed, so it doesn't uh, add any weightage for you. So in that case, only option is you pay 100% penalty of the tax amount becomes a penalty. Or if you don't claim that the goods is yours, if it is not gone by your invoice, so then luckily in those cases there is a 50% provision. So you are not going to claim that benefit. So probably you can look at that as an option first. So if uh, uh, goods are imported, then along with the uh, copy of the bill of entry has to be moved along with the goods, that is what they want. Along with the uh, bill of entry, they want the invoice copy of the eBay bill, which is supposed to be uh, there uh, with the person who is carrying the goods. So now they, are, they have said that it can be electronically carried? Yeah, it can be electronically carried. eBay bill number, if the number is mentioned, if it is completely filled, uh, like earlier also Isukam, when it was there under the Karnataka portal also, <laughs> on the invoice only a 8 digit number was sufficient. If they had the 8 digit number and the 8 digit number it is reflecting in their portal, it is not at all a problem. But practically what happens is, uh, if that number is uh, not there, see what happens again the person has to log in to verify whether that eBay bill is genuine, not genuine, all these issues will come. And luckily or unluckily if the portal is not updated and that person is going to download and this number is not getting reflected in that transaction. This has happened in one of our cases in the initial days in October. What happened was the goods have been shipped from Bangalore to, uh, it was going to I think uh, Shumoga. On the way in Chumkur they have withheld the thing. So form A was generated and form B was also updated. but. Uh, by the time the goods were uh, with them, only the form A copy was there with them, but the form B copy was not sent along with the goods. So which was a completely uploaded document which was not su submitted along with the goods. Then, uh, because the goods were very uh, in urgency, the customer wanted it, then these people told, no, we have to pay the penalty on the next day. The investigation officer, uh, the vigilant the team told that, no, you have to pay the taxes and we paid the penalty. So now we have gone and appeal on that, just because of the same issue. Because later on when we saw in the portal also it is showing that so and so day at 8.30 pm this was uploaded. But it was not carried along with the goods. So unnecessarily it is creating a nuisance. So it is always better to send the document to avoid all these uh, issues. Because the internet may not work in those particular places where it is. In few of them, there are remote locations where these people are going to be there. They have to log in, they have to see. So internet may not work. So you are seeing that so much of time is getting wasted for your transporter who is trying to share, transport your goods. Then uh, notification with respect to form ENR2, unique common number for the transporter is given for each. Uh, if there is more than one state, then he has to generate a 
ENR2 which is the form which has to be submitted then within uh, so this is they are trying to tell that the transporter or whoever is the person is also supposed to he is also liable it is not only the transporter the godown keeper the warehouse keeper wherever the goods of gst paid goods or gst suffered goods are going to get stored it could be on any of these people so these all people have to maintain proper documentation either they have to be registered or they have to maintain all the details of from whom the goods are coming and for whom the goods are going with the supporting of a e-waybill documentation which is supposed to be looked into. Then with respect to LPG cylinders, so empty LPG cylinders if they are moved then there is no e-waybill which is required. I think it is not uh, relevant for most of us. Then <coughs> this was a recent amendment which was there uh, in September which is very useful for each of us where if the detention or seizure of goods or conveyance uh, need not be initiated if it is for these particular six cases. So if there is spelling mistake in the name of the consignor or consignee name but the GST number is correctly mentioned then there is no issue. If there is an error in the PIN code, see many a times what happens the PIN codes have changed. We might have put the old PIN code but the new PIN code is one which is in existence. So because that is generally in our office it is uh, that is one problem because the vendors we have given our database has been created and our office is in Chainagar 7 block it was earlier it was a pin code of Bangalore 560082 now they have added to Bangalore 70 so 560070 so if the goods are coming to us if the vendor has my old pin code so he still puts it as a old pin code but it does not change the uh, scenario so that is what they want to tell so here there is a point which they tell this the validity of the e bill should not change because of the pin code because if the pin code is put as a particular pin code and if it is a different location because of the distance as such the validity of e bill should not change so that is another condition even if a pin code is changed then even if the address is not complete but if the locality is maintained mentioned say for example the entire address door number need not be mentioned if it is mentioned as Jayanagar Bangalore I think it should be sufficient that is what it tells in this particular then if there is an error in the document uh, number mentioned for example many a times the invoice numbers are on 15 digits so there is always a possibility of typographic errors which could get generated when the e bill is generated and the document number which both are going there could be a possibility in between 2332 there could be some typographic error which is there so this also could be a uh, one scenario where there is no penalty which has to be debit. Then they tell that uh, error in uh, four, or four or six digit, uh, but if the first two digits plus the rate is properly captured, then we don't have any issue. In all these cases, they tell that if these are identified, there could be in an IGST transaction, there could be a thousand rupees uh, which has to be levied, and if it is uh, the other taxes, CGST, SGST, then 500, 500 each has to be levied, and this has to be paid by GST DR, DR07, which is to be paid for every shipment which is happened. That is what they tell. So these are all treated as clerical errors and they were given a leeway on these transactions. And even the, I think there are few advanced rulings and before Canada, I think Kerala High Court also has given one of the advanced ruling, uh, sorry, the Kerala High Court has given a decision which has told that all procedural lapses should be condoned and no uh, very nominal amount of penalty was levied where these people would have levied 100% and uh, taken forward. So if you have any of the cases then we can rely upon this particular uh, notification or uh, this circular number and uh, you can see that this uh, uh, amount can be looked <coughs> into. Then with respect to uh, uh, textile sector, weavers and artisans, the goods which are stored in transporter go down, the transporter required to get registra uh, registration which is a difficulty so they have given them a leeway in this regard where it is a handicraft good or a good which are done with respect to the hand a little bit of leeway has been given then with respect to an additional place of business would be a sufficient uh, transaction for this particular tra thing which should be done then the transportation uh, under the e bill is a deemed to be a concluded one so there is no other additional document even in the year transportation under e bill is sufficient at all. Then uh, with respect to railways, 
So if the goods are transported through railways, then the railways are going to issue the goods only if the e-way bill is generated from your side and you give it only then the railways are supposed to issue the goods to you if it is coming through the railways. This is my way. Then if the goods are moving from one state to another state, but it is the end point are within the same state. For example, I want to send goods from Bangalore to Gulbarga, but the goods go to Anandpur and it reaches Gulbarga. Probably because the end point is Anand Gulbarga, which is in same state of Karnataka. So then, in this particular situation, what happens? They tell that you have to raise a e-way bill because it is passing through another state. So e-way bill is for movement, and movement is through another state. So once there is an interstate transaction, once there is a movement into another state, a e-way bill has to be generated, and the value does not matter in this particular cases. If it is within the state, then you have a 50,000 thing, but if it is outside the state, it is, if it is an interstate transaction levy. And wherever in case of e-way bill, I suggest is, see, to avoid complications, generate the bill and send it across, e-way, e-way bill and general, send it across to avoid complications. Then, there is an exemption with respect to goods which are sent from DTA to SEZ unit. If it is located within the same state, then e-way bill is not required, which is mentioned in our uh, circular 47 bar 18. Then there was an amendment uh, with respect to rule 55 of the CGST rules and here they have told that goods transport in CKD or SKD or batches or lots. So this batches and lots were the addition which was added and this was I think from 14th of uh, September 2018. So where it told that wow, the goods can be sent in lots and you can generate multiple e bills. So now in the portal, you can gen uh, generate multiple e bills for a single invoice. That is possible now. And they have amended transactions where even bill to ship to transactions also, they have made a provision where you can enter the consignor and the consignee's name both in a bill to ship to transaction. Both the uh, names can be entered and sent now when the shipments are happening. Earlier that provision was not there. Now I think from uh, November onwards that particular thing is uh, clearly open. So when the goods are sent in parts, what happens is the copy of DC uh, along with the invoice copy is sent and, and the last shipment when it comes, when the last consignment is sent, the original invoice is sent along with the last shipment. So that is what, because this could be there for batches. Many a times the cement industries you order for 1000 bags, they send you 500 bags, 250 bags, 250 bags like that. When they send in parts, they invoice one, do, they make one particular invoice, but they send the uh, dispatches at a later point. Fertilizer companies, these are the methodologies they follow. They raise the invoice first, then the goods are shipped in parts, depending upon the availability of the vehicles, because it could be you have ordered for a very big shipment and other lorries may not be available or the movement. For the moment, the logistics is not proper, then in that particular case, these sort of transactions could be applicable. <coughs> then now we come to the refunds and exports. So with refunds, uh, we just uh, get through a few of the notifications, uh, the clarifications and notifications with respect to the refunds. So with respect to uh, this particular circular which tells that restriction has been removed uh, for claiming of refund of unutilized ITC on goods notified under notification 5 of 2017 that is woven fabrics. So here they told that ITC is going to get lapsed from 31.7. This was for the textile industry. In textile industry they told that the uh, lab, there was a lapse of this ITC. But this ITC did not lapse on the total value, it was only for goods, ITC of goods or inputs only got lapsed and you had a credit which was available for the other aspects that is the capital goods and services that is still available. So you can even today if you have probably not taken the credit, see that those credits can still be taken now also because this was only after 1-8-2018 which is just about 4 months old. Any textile cases can you have a review, you can see that this particular ITC can be taken because it's an eligible ITC on capital goods and services, whatever is there. Because for the textile industries, what, what had happened, they had an inverted duty structure and they told they were not supposed to claim any 
credit, refund of credit was not given. But they told uh, as on 1 7 2000, uh, sorry, uh, 31st 7 2018, whatever balance was there, in that you will have to divide the three components. One is input service, input, and capital goods. So, input service and capital goods still you are eligible. Inputs only you have to reverse, basically. Okay. Then, uh, with respect to the refund application uh, on uh, here, is uh, with respect to filing of refund application under 55 to 18 months. That is from the last year of the quarter. See earlier they told last year of the financial year you will have time up to 24 months. But they have told now it is last year of a particular quarter. Say if we have exported something on say 30th of October, then your due date is starting or the time frame will start from 31st of December 2018 onwards. It's going to be 18 months. Okay. So we have to look at the quarter and that is what is going to determine. Anyway, most of our refunds are still on time. We can file the refunds on time. Then <clears throat> there are cases where when we are applying for a refund under 2A the credits are reflected and in few cases refunds uh, when we have applied 2A credits are not getting reflected. So wherever it is 2A is getting reflected they tell that no invoice or saw a document submission need be done. But later on in this particular notification or circular uh, 59 it told that a physical copy of the invoices have to be submitted. Later on, now in the GST council meeting, they are told that all submissions have to be done online. So even this particular documentation, what has to be submitted, whatever documentation of the invoices have to be submitted by way of a mail or in the portal. So that has to be done and they are given a leeway here. They are told that whatever online submissions are supposed to be done, it has to be done on the 31st of uh, so they will be giving a mail ID or uh, the email tells to whom I need to submit this particular documentation once I have filed a uh, refund claim. Then with respect to rejections, once a rejection is done with respect to the ITC and the officer identifies that I have claimed input on car for example, it's an ineligible credit. On car I am not supposed to claim a credit, motor car. So the idea officer identifies, he cannot deny me the credit or he can, he can deny me the refund and he tells that I will recredit it back to your account and he can issue a recovery notice under 73 or 74. This is the methodology what he has to adopt. If the rejection is for any other reason, then if we are not going for an appeal, he is going to ask us for a declaration that if I am going for an appeal, then he will not credit it to my account. If I give a declaration that I will not go and appeal, then in that particular scenario, he will recredit it to my account, which I can use for some other purpose. And uh, once, uh, uh, as I told you, refund under the present system till now is one, it has to be approved by one officer, that is the CGST officer and then again it has to go for approval of by the SGST officer. So once it comes, jurisdictional officer, CGST officer, he approves the transaction but SGST officer tells that this refund is not right. So he cannot deny you the refund. He has to issue the refund order and later on only he can, later on, file an appeal. So that is the only option which he has. If the reverse of it, SGST officer has issued a refund, CGST officer cannot deny you the refund. He has to give you the refund, then he has to go on an appeal. If he does not, if he is not happy with that particular thing, then he has to file an appeal before the appellate authorities. Okay? So he cannot withhold the application at all. And these are two uh, major uh, circulars which were there, there is 59 and 70. This talks about the major aspects with respect to the uh, online filing. So if there was a deficiency memo, generally a deficiency memo had to be issued within 15 days. So if a deficiency memo was issued, then what they told, refund will shall be recredited to the electronic credit ledger. And a fresh application has to be filed. That is what notification circular number 59 told. But 
Now what the because in the portal we don't have an option to file a fresh application for the same period because our case is still alive because there is a deficiency memo which has got uh, filed. So in those particular cases what they are telling is you will have to file a manual submission with the original ARN number for the refund whatever we have filed a ARN number comes. So with the same ARN number you will have to file a manual return per se with respect to the filing. That is what they have initiated here. And the minimum amount of refund what has to be claimed is 1000 rupees. If you cannot this uh, circular very clearly tells that in each of the heads, say CGST, SGST, IGST, each head separately 1000 rupees. The, the refund claim should be more than 1000 rupees. Say so all put together 1000 can I claim? You can't claim. So the, the refund will be rejected. I think uh, practically also surely we will not go for a 1000 rupees refund, right? Will we go? The cost of going to the office only is more. Nowadays all the income tax refunds earlier for 2000-3000 also we would go represent get the amounts few years ago maybe 10-15 years ago we would go and find out get the assessments done for the 2000 rupees. Now we will tell sir our cost of fire commutation only will not serve so we will, it is better not for us to not follow so we will probably make one or two calls to the CPC and see that whatever rectifications have to be done it is done unless uh, the client is very adamant on it. <clears throat> and uh, whoever have earlier, if a person had got capital goods uh, under the EPGC scheme, they were not allowed to go for a, a refund. But this particular clarification, it has given, this circular has told that I can go for a refund under the IGST provision even though I avail the benefit of the CG, uh, capital goods which have been procured under the EPGC license. So this one has to be kept in mind. <coughs> Sorry. So the fabric, uh, this is again with respect to 48 bar 18, this is relating to fabric. So fabric is restricted item for opting of refund. So earlier, whoever have gone for, uh, who have done job work basically and they have uh, the inverted uh, whatever because of the services, they had an inverted duty structure because they had job work was at the rate of 5% but they might have used chemicals worth uh, at the rate of 18% or 28% or 12% whatever they have procured. They can go for a refund because the restriction of non-claiming was only on goods and not on service because job work was a service and even today if you have not filed any refund applications if you have credits which have got accumulated, you can go for a refund here. You will be eligible for claiming the entire refund even for the last financial year. From July 17 onwards, if you have cases, you can still look at this. That is why I have kept this slide. Then uh, there was a precondition that if a refund has to be filed, GSTR 1 and GSTR 3, we both have to be filed for a particular associate. So that was the condition. But for composition dealers or ISD dealers or it could be the NRTP dealers who are supposed to claim a refund, for them one GSTR 1 and 3B are not the forms. They will have forms called 456. For them, it is not 1 and 3B. For them, it is the forms which are 456 which have to be filed. Karke. It is mentioned in the, this particular circular. Then uh, can persons of, uh, who are exporting goods which are exempt, for example rice, I am exporting rice but I have certain uh, charges or input services or there could be some capital goods which are used and I have got input credit. Will I be, will I be eligible for refund of those taxes? So because export uh, IGST transaction overtakes the aspect and it is an export transaction per se, once in an export transaction any taxes in lieu of this export I will be eligible for claiming of a refund and this is one aspect which has to be kept in mind so you can still go for a refund but there is no requirement of LUT or bond because LUT or bond is only for taxable goods and with respect to these transactions where it is an exempted goods then there is no requirement of 
There is no requirement of filing a bond or LUT. So the refund of unutilized IDC or input tax credit can be claimed by the RCCs. So, yes, yeah. The, the rice exempt from tax GST also can be refunded? Yes, sir. If it is export only. Local supplies or interstate supplies within India, it will not be possible. But if it is a transaction where I am exporting the goods, then I can still claim what are the input services which I generally use. I can go for a refund of all that. That will be there. That is why I have put refund of unutilized input tax credit can be claimed on a monthly basis. Whatever is the total amount that can be claimed. There is no reversal which is required on this particular transaction. But if I have both exports as well as I have local sales, in that particular case, to the extent of local sales, whatever percentage, that reversal has to be done. Only the balance amount I will be eligible for going for the refund per se. Okay. I think this is a repetition of whatever we have uh, looked into. And this is with respect to fabrics which I told you. The same thing is there in the, this particular slide. Can I go for a refund of uh, GST as well as can I claim a duty drawback under the customs? Can I claim both the things? Few yes, few no. Why not? See, under the particular refund, there is uh, a particular provision which is very clearly telling that I should not have claimed a duty drawback under any of the law. But here, because it's a custom duty drawback and the conditions are the duty drawback, when you are going for a GST refund itself, you are supposed to not claim this particular duty drawback. But there are few things like MEI scripts or SEI scripts which are available. Those sort of uh, scripts can be claimed because that is not a part of this particular provision per se. You can take that particular view. Okay. Then refunds are held because of clerical errors where GSTR 1, I am not shown my details properly. What should I do? In those particular cases, you have to amend the GSTR table 9. So table 9 of GSTR 1 has to be amended. You try to match up these details and then only you will have to do the filings per se. So what happens if there are errors in GSTR 3B? That is the only sad news that if uh, any changes or any mistakes have happened in GSTR 3B and that is not matching, even then we have to go for a manual filing and we have to request the officer that that has got rectified because you had time and you have time now also to rectify an error which has taken place even in the last financial year that can be adjusted in the current 3B whatever is there. So those rectifications have to be done and we will have to show them that it has been rectified on so and so date and we have to give an explanation and claim for a refund. Then uh, exports uh, without LUT. So there is a clarification uh, of 37 by 2018 which told that for small procedural uh, lapses the substantive benefit should not be denied. So they are told that substantive benefit should not be denied for procedural lapses. So based on that, this uh, we can take this particular provision and uh, this particular circular reference and put it before the authorities that because the GST law is new and because of this, you should allow us to claim the refunds. Uh, sir, it is certainly applicable only for export of goods or export of services. Yes, sir. Uh, export of services. This is more with respect to export of goods only, I think this particular uh, circular. I think for, but uh, I think you can always go take it forward with respect to uh, here it, because it is more on this uh, it speaks about zero rated supplies. So I think you can go for uh, even services as well. And then with respect to delaying filing of uh, furnishing of LUT, there, there was a, uh, sorry, this particular circular told that if LUT has not been uh, uh, issued or taken for the shipment, the LUT can be taken at a later date and the same number can be provided for all the filings which you have done at a later point of time. So if uh, even for 17, 18 you have not done an LUT, probably you can apply it now also online and you can see that if that particular number is given for the export shipment purpose, then the transaction will get concluded and we can file the returns. Otherwise, the refund applications will not be accepted. <coughs> So 
I already spoke about GSTR 3B which was there. Then we will speak about clarifications uh, for uh, manual filing. Then with respect to accommodation services, SEZs, when SEZs are taking services off, the accommodations or uh, conferences which are outside the SEZ, they take it. So what sort of a transaction, whether it's an inter interstate transaction or an intrastate transaction, was the clarification which was there and this was given in circular 48 where it told that these transactions uh, between the between the conferencing because based on the place of supply this was treated as a interstate transaction so because this transaction what the uh, the clarification told is a inter interstate transaction whereas the advance billing there was an advance billing in Karnataka itself I think so in this particular uh, advance billing they told is because it's a place of supply is of immobile property and is located in that particular jurisdiction only and this cannot be an interstate transaction and an intrastate transaction so there is some amount of confusion with this particular transaction and now this has been overcome by uh, the new law which uh, is going to be promulgated where they tell that supply to an SEZ so they have amended there are a few amendments with respect to the particular law which is there so there they have told in one of the amendments they have amended the refunds for SEZs so SEZ, any supply to SEZ will not be treated as a zero rated supply for the purpose of claiming a refund so the SEZ has to claim a refund per se so I when I am providing a service to the SEZ because they have amended that particular provision then exports, generally exports have to be uh, done within a 3 month gap so within the 90 days the goods have been removed from the factory or the place of removal then it has to get exported what happens if it is more than 3 months so if it is more than 3 months they have uh, yeah, based on the decisions or based on the situation this 3 months could be extended as if we have to write a letter to the jurisdictional officer so the jurisdictional commissioner uh, we can seek time and the export could happen even at a later point of time as well then deficiency memo so if a deficiency memo uh, has been issued can there be multiple deficiency memos so this clarification has told that only one deficiency memo can be given at a point of time for a particular refund claim so can you claim a refund of transitional credit a refund of transitional credit cannot be claimed only if there are exports and you can remove the, uh, that particular shipment has to be done with export of with payment of duty and only those who are eligible to be claimed in this regard and uh, if there is a difference of exchange rate between the GST invoice and the shipping bill what has to be considered for the purpose of refund so this particular clarification has told that you will have to take the lower of the value whether it is the invoice value of the GST or the shipping bill whichever is lower has to be go, taken for the purpose of refund claim <coughs> and here uh, with respect to uh, the uh, FIRC and BRC is it required for both goods and services FIRC is foreign inward remittance certificate or the bank realization certificate is it required for export of goods see basically for uh, under the refund mechanism there is no condition for goods that the realization has to happen it should be that the shipping bill is filed and the goods have got exported that is a sufficient cost but the department could insist on this particular thing that the amount is also realized per se because as per the RBI guidelines also you are supposed to realize this amount so that is the only criteria otherwise they cannot insist on this particular documentation for supply of goods then you have supply to a merchant exporter so supply to a merchant exporter so if a supply is made to a merchant exporter then the rate of tax what is being given is at 0.5% or sorry 0.05% or 1% is the scheme which is allowed this is a form of a inverted duty structure which is there when it comes to the refunds but if I am a manufacturer and I have procured as a merchant exporter I have procured certain items and I am I have procured the items say one crore item I have procured at paying 0.1% can I go for with payment of duty? So here there is a glitch that when I, when I am claiming any concessional rate of benefits, I cannot do an export with payment of duty. I have to go for without payment of duty only in that particular situation.
scenarios. So this is what is one aspect which is to be kept in mind here. Then we will come into a few aspects of registration. So in case of casual taxable person or a CTP, say a person from Delhi wants to have an exhibition done in Bangalore, he takes a CTP registration in Bangalore. So what is the amount of duty deposit which he has to do? It is on the net tax liability because I am going to procure some items here locally as a CTP and if there are some credits, then those credits have to be given and only the balance value, say I have a purchases of 1 crore, I am I have to pay tax on 1 and a half crore, say it is a jewelry company 3%, so on 50 lakhs 3% whatever is the amount of 15,000 or uh, 1 and a half lakhs which has to be paid on that particular transaction that becomes a net liability. I have to consider only the net liability for the transactions. And exhibitions generally of a CDP is for uh, see a casual taxable person registration is given granted only for 180 days but it can go up to, it can be extended by the uh, authorities if they want it to be for more than 180 days giving the proof of Ship, uh, proof, uh, proof of the premises, place of premises or the letter of uh, allotment for that particular, maybe it could be an exhibition or a place where it is being given. So, if you have a rental agreement or a letter of allotment for that particular place can be given for taking a CDP registration. Cancellation of registration. If a person does not file a return for 6 months, then automatic cancellation notices are issued and this is being given in uh, GS form. GST RIG 17 and we have been receiving uh, cases where if we have not uh, filed the returns within 6 months for a particular SSC then we have to see that they file it otherwise and you will be given 7 working days time to reply. If you don't reply within the 7 working days then the registration can be deemed cancelled if we don't reply. So we have to reply in the portal there is a form GST RIG 18. And this is how the GST uh, cancellation uh, thing is going to look like. So the GST RG 17 form which look like. Okay. Then there are few miscellaneous aspects. So seeks for uh, payment of duty. So I think uh, the RCM mechanism we know that it is postponed up to 30th 9, 2019 for all input uh, <coughs> services or goods which are procured from unregistered persons, so that is there as on today. Then there is a GST residential program or camps meant for advancement of sea. There is a uh, programs which are there with respect to religion, spiritual, uh, spirituality and yoga which are exempted. But if it is provided uh, uh, along with accommodation and it is meant for advancement of a charitable trust, then that portion becomes taxable. So this is being given by way of a circular. Then circular with respect to the procedure in respect of returns of time expired goods or uh, drugs. So here they have told with respect to time expired goods earlier, this uh, happens more in the pharma industry where expired goods were being sent across to the manufacturer. So it comes to the manufacturer or the distributor and the distributor sends it to the manufacturer. So earlier the feeling was not happening in this particular transaction but now they have made it uh, a simple process where they have told that a fresh uh, supply invoice can be raised on the manufacturer or the distributor. The retailer can raise it on the distributor. A fresh invoice can be given or a credit note along with the uh, transaction that the conditions of this taxation can be given. So this particular transaction is done. <coughs> now uh, with respect to input tax credit, this is a amendment which was uh, done with respect to the uh, rule 36 subsection 2 where the conditions, see under section 16 there are certain conditions but here under rule 36 2 they have told that only 4 things are supposed to be required now for claiming of a credit. If it is not reflected in 2A also it doesn't matter if these 4 things are done. So the document does not, does not contain all the particulars but contains the amount of details which are charged is sufficient. Total value of goods supplied along with goods or services or both or it could be the description of goods or GSTIN of the supplier or the recipient if it is given and the place of supply in case of inter interstate supplies. So these are the five conditions if they are there along with the payment that you have made it to the 
particular supplier, then in that particular case, there is still a possibility for me to take credit because now these transactions are subject matter because everyone are of a view that only if it gets reflected under 2A it is eligible but I can still fight out a case taking that this taking this particular shelter because this is a substantial piece of law so it is not changed and this is more in a clarificatory in nature so once it is clarificatory in nature we can still try to take contention that the credit has to be given because we have got the documentation and what is prescribed are these four conditions and based on this condition we can still take a credit. Sir, so we sir. cannot utilize it. Yeah. We cannot utilize it. You can also utilize it. You can utilize it. Can utilize it. But if you don't want to take a chance, you can uh, keep it and you can keep it pending so that you can tell them you have not utilized it and uh, later on if uh, the provision, so the department tells I have not utilized it, so at least penalties can be uh, avoided. Sir, if uh, GST IN of uh, both supplier and recipient are available, it will automatically come in 2A, no? Uh, if the person has uploaded it properly. If the other person has not uploaded it properly, so if he has done it as a B2C, instead of doing it as a B2B, he has done it as a B2C and he does not have a time to rectify it now. So then in that particular case, it can never get rectified as such. So in those situations, there are still issues. If the quantum is good amount and uh, it is uh, testing the waters, so we can try to go for a litigation and see that this particular transaction is uh, it is eligible. So you can try to see if we can take it further on litigation. And with respect to accommodations, so it is a declared tariff versus actual price. So declared tariff is 1200, actual price is 900. So what will be the rate of GST which is applicable because GST rate up to 1000 is exempted so 1000 onwards it is taxable. <coughs> uh, earlier we were all paying based on the declared tariff so now the declared tariff concept has not, uh, has not been initiated under the GST regime so in that particular scenario yes so on the actual price so we have to look at the actual price of 900 and because of that it's less than the thousand rupees mark so we need not pay the taxes then the next one is bed charges where the amount of a basic tariff is 7000 but because of the extra bed charges the tariff is totally 8000 so 1000 is the basic tariff extra bed charges is thousand rupees so what is the slab because the slab is changed at the 7500 there is a change in the slab what slab is going to get affected for this particular transaction So extra bed charges is a separate transaction altogether because the base transaction whatever is the amount so for 7000 whatever is the amount applicable rate applicable the same rate will be applicable even for 8000 per se. So during the winter the tariff is 900 and during summer the tariff is 1200. So what should be uh, is there going to be a change in the tariff or uh, the GST rates on this particular transaction. So because the actual yes. Whenever it is changing. Yes. So the tariff what I am collecting is in winter is 900. So I will not be collecting GST on this amount. Whereas in summer when the GST is because the tariff is cross 1000. Uh, the actual amount whatever I have collected is 1200. So I will be paying tax in this particular month. For the same room, same facility, only season change. So we are paying taxes or not paying taxes. Depends on the actual amount which is received. Sir, if the extra bit charge is only 1000 rupees and you still a separate tra transaction. <coughs> Then there is no, no GST? No, 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 because this is a part of the composite supply. So the composite supply, what is the composite supply rate which is applicable? So the rate is applicable is because you don't give only extra bit, right? So after the room only an extra bit has to be given. So in that case, uh, whatever we are charging, it's a composite supply. And based on the composite supply, the, the transaction is going to be looked into. Service charges? Yes. Service charges? Service charges also becomes a part of the composite supply. So if they are charging say service charges at the rate of 10%, on the total value, whatever 8000 plus service charges, because there you might have to see because on 7000 if 10% uh, is added, so the total value is going to become 7700, the slab could change that's all. So the slab of GST will change accordingly. What will be the composition rate applicable to bakeries as a manufacturer or as a restaurant or as a trader? See, uh, in this particular clarification, uh, they have clarified that 
the uh, this particular thing is treated as a restaurant per se. The rate applicable for restaurants will be applicable even for bakeries. <coughs> then uh, one more important thing, which is on tenancy rights. So on tenancy rights, they tell that uh, this 44 part 2018 very clearly tells that any tenancy premium which is collected, whatever you call it as pagdi, goodwill. Anything which is other than refundable, which is a deposit which is collected, which is non-refundable in nature, that partakes the character of a principal service and that becomes taxable. So that is one of the aspects. Where there is a dwelling house, if it is a, a, a building which is used for residential purpose, for dwelling, for use as a residence, then there is no GST on that particular transactions. And even for this particular residential dwellings, if for, see there are few cases where they ask for lease. So you give me it for 5 year lease or 6 years lease or 4 years lease, I give you a big amount of deposit and the amount is refunded back. So in those cases also because it's for a residential purpose, there will be no liability of taxes on this particular transaction. And any amount, say a tenant, he had agreed that I will be there for 24 months. But after 18 months he vacated, 6 months rent he gave you as a <coughs> claim charges. So those charges will also be treated as a service charge and you have to pay taxes on that aspect also. Okay. So next I will just take you through one or two of the amendments and then uh, we will just uh, look at these amendments which are important. So I think this could be a repetition. So how many wants me to take the amendments aspect? <coughs> want us to continue yeah so because this amendment sir is uh, one uh, which is why is it important i will tell you because amendments have got uh, approved in the parliament but the problem is states are not it uh, all the states have not approved it so now what the gst council in the latest meeting has told that 23 states have agreed the remaining states are supposed to do it by the 1st of February and they want to make this effective date of this amendment. Earlier you saw effective, any effective which was there under service tax or excise, they had a cut off date and we had a cut off date from when the parliament session happened, once the presidential assent was happened, immediately on the next uh, date of official government, these notifications were effective but whatever amendments were proposed by the amendment act 2018 are still not effective to the extent because all the states did not approve it. So the remaining states have to approve it and only after 1st of February this is going to be impacted. So because of this particular aspect it is very important to be looked into. See the first one which is very important today is there is a retrospective amendment with respect to supply. So I have put the existing law as well as the amendment law. So in the existing law so what all uh, transactions which were there, there was a change only with respect to 71D. So this 71D was completely removed. What did this 71D read as under? So the activities to be treated as supply of goods or supply of services as referred to in Schedule 2. So anything even if it was treated as a supply as per Schedule 2, that transaction was treated as a supply. That is what was the reading we initially got. So now after the amendment, what they did, 71D was removed because that 71D is important. They have removed this 71D. So now what they have told with respect to this 71A they have inserted. So 71A what they told where certain activities or transactions constitute a supply in accordance with the provisions of subsection 1, they shall be treated either as a supply of goods or service as referred to in Schedule 2. So now what they are telling is, if under 7A, B and C, if that particular transaction falls under the ambit of supply, then only it is treated as a supply, else this particular transaction will not be treated as a supply. Once if it is treated as under A, 7A, 7B, 7C, under this particular classification, if this particular transaction is there, only that will be treated as supply. And when I go to Schedule 2, I am going to, in Schedule 2, I am only going to see whether it is goods or service. So Schedule 2 is only designed whether I am going to identify whether it is going to be a goods or service under this particular transaction per se. Okay. So 
With respect to uh, RCM, so they have told that the reverse charge mechanism under 9.4 earlier till 39.2019 you know that RCM has been deferred to but now they have given to in a different angle so now they want to give specified transaction or specified class of purchases specified type of products maybe I am just giving you examples there could be something like uh, uh, raw material for uh, say real estate could be a possibility where they feel that this amount should become more uh, estimate and they try to bring this 9.4 in picture they may forget about the transactions of coffee tea expenses and all those, those are the smaller ones but they want to see main or the uh, purchases related whatever are the consumables or purchases which are related to the manufacture or trading they can identify they can give a class of people so if it is sold by so and so people so and so class of people then these are areas which are supposed to be looked into so this is one methodology where they want to bring in so some analysis is going on on this particular aspect and they are going to come out with some threshold limit or the metal up to 5000 now they are given an exemption up to 5000 the metal up to 50000 we will not worry about this particular thing we may anything above 50000 purchases have to be through registered dealers because now I was just uh, before entering the session I was just looking on uh, with respect to one of the finance minister of uh, I think West Bengal so he has uh, promulgated an uh, option of registration they want to tell that 20 lakhs uh, limit they want to set it to 75 lakhs so this is the uh, uh, given by the financial express today uh, so for all MSME category they want to give a leeway up to 75 lakhs the 20 lakhs should be given for all MSME categories but we should look at what could be the impact because many of the transactions of many of the dealers see if you have to transact with a particular class of people if you want to say transact through Amazon he wants your GST registration so you can never go away from it if you are want to uh, say register for say Ashok Leyland or it could be uh, some of the companies like Maruti Suzuki then they want you to be registered they don't want to deal with unregistered persons they don't want to take any additional responsibility so they are seeing that they want all the persons to be registered so that could be one of the things and this aggregate turnover of for composition dealers is now 1.5 percent 1.5 crores right yes or no yes. no because this as the act was not still approved by all the states this also has got postponed so this 1.5 crores is only which will be again notified from after 1st of February probably so kindly cross verify if any of your composition dealers have crossed the 1 crore turnover then they might have to move to the regular regime per se and uh, whoever are composition dealers they can do a turnover of up to 10% of the previous year turnover whatever is the previous year turnover I can do 10% of that amount as the uh, service portion so any composition dealer can get commission now to the extent of 10% but again this also is a ordinance as it's an amendment has got approved but it does not got its uh, tooth still okay then inclusion of the following under schedule 3 so schedule 3 is neither goods not service so here they have added about four categories of people the three categories of things have been added so supply of goods from a place in a non-taxable non territory to another place in a non-taxable territory so these are called as trans, uh, trans shipment sales but the goods don't come into India so I buy from Sri Lanka and I sell it to China so in this particular case what happens the goods are moving directly from Sri Lanka to China or it could be reverse probably in those cases these transactions are treated as neither supply of goods nor supply of services and there is no reversal which needs to be uh, done and it could be inbound sales or it could be IC sale transactions all these transactions they want to bring it under the schedule 3 it's a part of the schedule 3 now but this uh, there, will, there, were, there are few clarifications which tell that the taxes need not be paid but only issue is with respect to the reversals of input tax credit even though this is not there we, we have the opinion that this particular transaction need not be uh, suffering the, the ITC no reversal need to be done on this particular aspect and uh, 
to bring that in line they have uh, amended section 17.3 to tell that the formula of reversal under for 42 and 43 is we need not consider that in the denominator that is what numerator and denominator the ICCL value and these uh, transactions can be removed. Then every uh, e-commerce uh, person or e-commerce operator has to take registration under the GST and only when he is required to collect the tax at source. Okay. Then with respect to 17.5 there are few amendments which are there. The input tax credit with respect to motor vehicles which is available only with the seating capacity of less than 13. So if it is more than 13, any vehicle with a seating capacity of more than 13, I can take the credit but I should be using it for the output category. Then ITC on insurance repair servicing of motor vehicles. So even now you can still take the credit of ITC on repairs and maintenance of motor vehicle because this is a new line of amendment but this amendment has not yet worked in uh, the two way for execution because the states have not approved this particular thing. Then ITC on outdoor catering, leasing, motor vehicle, uh, renting of motor vehicle, all these things is allowed only in the case where it is obligatory or, or there is a uh, law based on the law. For example, Karnataka, we have some ladies, if they are going after 8 o'clock in the night, then uh, service has to be given, a cab service has to be given, a drop fee facility has to be given. So in those cases there is a law which is there. So if it is a factory act, food has to be provided free of cost if there are more than 250 employees and above. So in those cases you will have to, you can take the input credit which need not be denied. So an ITC of vessels, uh, uh, aircraft, with, uh, if it is uh, except which is used for specified purposes. If I am using this uh, aircraft and vessels for uh, generally aircraft, if it is used for training, training purposes. I am charging some fee for training, for example pilot training. So I am charging fees for the, using this particular airlines. Then in those particular cases, I will be allowed to take the credit or uh, else this will not be allowed. Then uh, multiple registrations. Now the concept of business vertical has been done away with. Now you can go for multiple registrations within the state, each and each place, whatever you want, you can go for a separate registration under the single plan. You can go for a separate registration for each and every <coughs> facility you want. So this, many of the PSUs have got a major relief out of this particular transaction. But if you are an SEZ, what happens if you are an SEZ and you have a DTI unit, then you have to go for two separate registrations, one for the SEZ and one for the non-SEZ or the DTI unit, you have to go for a separate registration. So this uh, is a total uh, aspect which is supposed to be done away with. Now they have done away with the concept of business vertical. So business vertical has been done away with. <coughs> then uh, this is a welcome move which is being done where multiple for multiple invoices single credit note and multiple credit notes for a single invoice both these are going to get activated in the near future because the law has already bought the change but only thing the aspect has to be concluded by the states. Then zero rated supplies which I already discussed. So if I am doing a supply to a SEZ that is no uh, 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 for the refund purpose this will not be treated as a export for the purpose of uh, zero rated supplies this will not be considered. So if uh, I am providing services to an SEZ I can either go for an LUT if I am not going for an LUT or one I have to charge the tax on the SEZ and the SEZ can claim the credit or it can go for a refund of whatever ITC is left on the SEZ uh, portal whatever is the amount. And uh, for refund claims the end of the financial year the word has been replaced with due date due date so due date is due date of filing the returns whether it is monthly or quarterly depends upon the filing of return and from the end of the month or end of the quarter we will allow to take the credits. So the time frame has got reduced to some extent here when this is the refunds uh, time the time frame for refunds have got reduced to that extent because they have made it a monthly or quarterly. So and with respect to advance ruling I want to uh, tell one point that now in this new budget, new uh, 31st uh, GST council meeting they have told that the centralized authority, <coughs> appellate authority has created an advance ruling 
centralized authority because they have seen now that different states are giving different rulings and there are contradictory decisions and to have a uh, streamlining of these particular cases, they are creating a centralized appellate authority and all the decisions are going to be reviewed by the centralized appellate authority. This is also a welcome move so that all the decisions are in favor, are giving a single uh, decision. There cannot be a contradictory decision and it is more like a higher forum to give a single decision. So they are trying to move this. So Based on this, there are a number of advanced rulings. So, now, once uh, the advanced rulings, because a advanced ruling authority has been uh, envisaged and this particular uh, advanced ruling authority is going to get more streamlined. So, as of now, also, you are getting decisions at a faster pace compared to earlier initial period. Now, you file immediately within the next uh, one month or so. We filed an application in the month of November, already we have got a hearing. 31st there is a hearing, so we will be going for the hearing on 31st and probably the decision could be there out in, a, in another 15 days or a month's time probably. So that is the way in which the advanced ruling is also doing. So and I think uh, with this particular uh, aspect I thank the uh, Bangalore branch management for giving me an opportunity for uh, being here before you people and uh, sharing my views and uh, I would be uh, more than uh, happy if any other queries are there, I could take up the queries and we could answer it either uh, online or offline depending on the time what is being granted now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, see, members, a big applause to the Chamasekar. Before presenting a moment to the thanking the speaker, I can could recognize the C. Gita Hedi who won the election recently concluded uh, the Sahasi and made us all Karnataka as a proud on behalf of members present here once again I can go with them. Coming to the today's session, on behalf of members present here, on behalf of managing the Bangalore branch, I would like to thank Shri Chavu Sekar for instantly accepted our invitation and immediately came here and sharing his knowledge and experience on the GST event. I request Shri Sujata Radhaman to come forward and present a memento on behalf of all of us. A big applause members. Members, in January we have a uh, series of one day seminars. One day seminar on editing standards, one day seminar on e-commerce, one day seminar on pharma industry. May uh, well in advance uh, your attendance and register. And I thank all the members for attending this today's circle. Thank you.